Hi there, and welcome to Critical Mass TV. This is the grassroots variety show that believes the open source planning of a well-informed public would be worlds better than the self-serving disaster coming from today's billionaires club. Meaningful democracy, anyone? How about some um, Mixed Mental Arts for Intellectual Self-Defense. All right, today is Sunday, November 24th. Thanks for joining us. We are live on VCAM in beautiful Burlington, Vermont. Please remember that um, you can call in if you'd like and share your thoughts. The phone number is 802-651-0589. Critical mass is the smallest number of people it takes to change the world. So let's shake it up. All of the opinions expressed tonight belong to the speakers and are not necessarily those of the guests or of the station, even though they should be. My name is Brad Hartley and sitting in with me tonight is a friend and local concerned citizen, Arthur Hines. How's it going, Arthur? Great. Glad to be here. Good. Good to have you here, man. So we have two segments on the show tonight. In the first, Arthur and I are going to discuss nuclear power and specifically the ongoing calamity at Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant in Japan. Secondly, on Kathy's art break, her guest will be Tom Cresswell, with a look at paleo-expressionist art from France. Who knew that French art went all the way back for 30,000 years? All right, let's open the eye. So first of all, a nuke plant, like all thermal power plants, converts water to steam. The steam spins turbines connected to generators, which produce electricity. It sounds simple enough. Unfortunately, like coal, oil, and natural gas-powered plants, there are waste products produced both before and after the generating process. Coal, oil, and gas plants spew most of their byproduct into the air and externalize their waste in that way. In a nuke plant, the spent fuel rods must be removed and put somewhere, which usually means being stacked in pools or concrete casks that are on site of the nuclear plant. So not only do you have the risk of managing an active nuclear fission reaction in the collection of rods that's called the core, you have thousands of years of risk containing the radioactive mess left over and protecting it against earthquake, tsunami, or even acts of war or terrorism. I remember uh, in the airline hijacking frenzy of like the early 70s. Skyjackers um, forced a jet to circle the nuclear fluster cluck of Oak Ridge, Tennessee, and the bomb plants there and their um, on-site nuclear reactors, threatening to crash into the site if their demands weren't met. Um, they went on to circle Nixon's uh, Miami Winter White House and then they finally flew on to and landed in Cuba. But um, it's a meaningful threat to say that um, we all know that a commercial jetliner can be skyjacked and, and uh, you know, bad things can happen. 
So um, the on-site storage of nuclear waste is uh, problematic for many, many reasons. So um, the threats to these facilities are real and almost impossible to eliminate. We're going to show a short video now about the present state of the Fukushima Daiichi um, nuclear plant. And uh, then when we return, Arthur and I will discuss some underreported aspects of Fukushima and nuclear power. Hey, Jim, are you out there? Can we watch that video? We were told three partial meltdowns, don't worry about it. Now we know it was 100% core melt in all three reactors. Um, Japan is, by orders of magnitude, many times worse than Chernobyl. Never in my life did I think that six nuclear reactors would be at risk. Well, TEPCO is like the little Dutch boy. All of a sudden, we have cracks in the dike. You put a finger here, you put a finger there, and all of a sudden, new leaks start to occur, and they're overwhelmed, literally making it up as they go along. We're in totally uncharted territories. You get any nuclear engineering book, look at the last chapter, and this scenario is not contained in the last chapter of any nuclear engineering textbook on the planet Earth. So they're making it up as they go along, and we are the guinea pigs for this science experiment that's taking place. All radiation is damaging, it's cumulative, each dose you get adds to your risk of getting cancer. Within days of the Fukushima Daiichi catastrophe beginning, we were getting uh, fallout coming down in rain in the United States, not in insignificant quantities. And also, of course, the, uh, the seafood, um, not only does the ocean's currents bring the radioactivity this way, but also uh, the sea life itself, the bluefin tuna, uh, migrated from Japan to North America and carried the radioactive cesium in its flesh over here. Wow, not a good time to be eating tuna. The food chain remains contaminated for hundreds or thousands of years and we'll start seeing lung cancer and leukemia I think two to five years from now. And then solid cancers will start appearing um, 15 to 60, 70 years later. So the ace up the sleeve is, of the nuclear industry is the incubation time for cancer. It takes a long time for cancers to develop once you have inhaled or been exposed to these radioactive elements. And no cancer identifies its origin. And so there is already a level of cancer in society, but it's going to increase dramatically. The problem is not really under control. It Doesn't will not it? be under control for, it's estimated, between 40 and 100 years from now. There's no way to clean it up. They say 40 years, but they can't clean it up. They can't. And the site's still unstable and vulnerable to natural disasters. If there is another earthquake, a serious one, six, seven, eight, or nine magnitude, that would rattle all these 10, 1,060 tanks. It would rattle the, the, the damaged cores, spent fuel, who, whose structures have already weakened. Yes. That's a potential very, very serious threat. Approximately 300 tons of water was filtering through the site until early this month, becoming laced with radioactive materials and then seeping into the sea. Another factor is the ever-increasing amount of water accumulating inside damaged infrastructure. Once it makes its way into reactor buildings, it mixes with radioactive isotopes for months, TEPCO workers have been pumping up 
400 tons of water every day and storing it in tanks on site. Uh, the, there are 1,060 tanks, stainless steel water tanks, that are holding the water which they keep pumping into the, into the uh, damaged reactors and the uh, uh, spent fuel storage pools. From the air, the scale of the problems at Fukushima become clear. The growing mass of storage tanks now dwarfs the plant itself. More than a million tons of highly radioactive water is now stored here. But the tanks have been hastily built. They're made of steel plates, bolted together, rather than welded. Last week, workers detected a major leak in one of those tanks. About 300 tons of water escaped, releasing several quadrillion becquerels of radioactive particles. Experts have often pointed out how vulnerable they are to damage. The tanks, though, have been put together very quickly. There's no guarantee they'll last. Their seals are made of rubber, and the joints and, and bolts are corroding. And they may last not more than five years. So the tank farm has grown dramatically, and it's on the hill. Of course, the problem is, because it's on the hill, the um, water flows down. And if there's an earthquake, all of these pipes are held together with plastic piping. Not much different than what you've got on a swimming pool. So the plastic pipe will, will, will um, snap, and that water will just run right down that roadway directly into the ocean. And how long the contamination has been leaking into the water? Very likely since the uh, explosions and the meltdown at uh, Fukushima Daiichi in March of uh, 2011. Wow, that, that is quite a long time. Now, how much and what sort of radiation is leaking into the Pacific? I know there's all different types, so if you can explain that right. in a little detail. Well, clearly what we've seen now is the movement of radioactive hydrogen, tritium, uh, which uh, is a uh, mobile uh, radioactive isotope, but clearly um, radioactive cesium-134, 137, strontium-90, we're seeing a full range of radioactive contaminants now moving, which indicate that uh, the damaged cores of these reactors, the meltdowns themselves, uh, have, are now contributing to the contamination of the Pacific Ocean and groundwater that's moving at about a, a rate of a 300 to 400 gal, uh, metric tons uh, per day. So The radiation has been leaking into the water and polluting the fish continuously for the last two years. Radioactive iodine 129, its half-life is 17 million years, plus strontium, plus cesium, plus tritium, and I could go on and on and on. If it gets into the sea, the algae concentrated hundreds of times, then the crustaceans concentrated hundreds of times, then the little fish, then the big fish, then us. Because we stand on the apex of the food chain. You can't taste these radioactive elements, you can't see them, and you can't smell them. They're silent. This graphic shows the gradual contamination of the Pacific Ocean due to leaks of radioactive water from the crippled Fukushima nuclear plant in Japan. The simulation, which was run by a German marine research institute, shows the entire Pacific waters being polluted by radioactive water in just six years. The fuel core of Unit 4 at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant. More than 1,500 fuel rods sit in a damaged storage pool 30 metres above ground. The, the amount of radioactivity within the, in the rods themselves is about 14,000 times that of the, the Hiroshima bomb. We are dealing with diabolical energy. E equals mc squared. It's the energy that blows up nuclear bombs. Einstein said nuclear power is a hell of a way to boil water. They need to remove those fuel rods from the pool because if there's another earthquake, building four would go down probably and the, all those fuel rods would be exposed to the air and they would burn and they would release ten times more radiation or cesium than was released at Chernobyl. Huge amounts and pollute much of Japan and the northern hemisphere. So we're in a nuclear crisis at the moment. If there's another earthquake and building four collapses, which contains the cooling pool with fresh fuel, I'm going to evacuate my family from Boston. 
So they've put a crane on top of that building, which is shaky anyway. And they're going to lift the fuel assemblies out one by one with the crane, and it will be done manually. Normally, those rods are removed by computer control with millimetres to spare. It's a very delicate operation. The fuel rods must be kept submerged and must not touch each other or break. Nuclear experts warn any mishaps could cause an explosion many times worse than that one here in March 2011. Because if several rods touch each other, you could reach criticality and the whole fuel pool could go critical. Or if the rods break as they're being lifted out, large amounts of radiation would escape from the rods and the area would have to be evacuated, meaning that if the area is evacuated, the continuous operation of cooling five spent fuel pools and three melted cores would stop. <laughs> Need I go on? All right. Um, wow. What, um, what strikes me first, I guess, Arthur, is the amount of censorship by the U.S. corporate media around Fukushima and just and nuclear power in general. I, you know, I just, you know, I guess most of that information there, except for maybe the report of the, le the one leaking tank and the 80,000 gallons or whatever that leaked, that's, I think that's the only thing I heard reported in the last couple of months. It's so incredibly outrageous that they have, you know, an accident and danger on, on this scale, really literally threatening the entire world. And the, the uh, nuclear industry is still keeping a muzzle on it and trying to hide it, trying to pretend everything's fine. Yeah. They made a, TEPCO made a, you know, videos, you know, to reassure everybody without even, you know, letting out all the in information by a long shot of what's really going on and saying, oh, we have it under control or, you know, we built this building and we'll just take them out and, you know, everything's fine, no problem. And, you know, I have the Pacific Ocean being polluted and, you know, on and on. It's just outrageous. And the dangerous fuel rod removal operation, you know, manually using cranes and I guess, I don't know, like chains on each one of those units and just trying to pull it out of there. Manually, uh, by, as a crane operator, by crane, myself, crane I, operators, uh, you yeah. have no millimeters of, you know, of tolerance. Yeah, I mean, I, I operate a crane, and uh, and it's uh, you know it's difficult to get within two or three feet of an object, let alone millimeters. I it's um, so uh, just a few years ago, the um, the atomic greenwashing, I call it, seen and heard in the U.S. media trumpeted like a nuclear renaissance, they called it, of um, the Nuclear Power 2010 program um, pushed by the Obama administration and the industry. Most of these applications for new construction uh, have been withdrawn, citing you know, economic reasons. Um, foremost, I think, those cheap natural gas produced by fracking is probably the largest factor in these canceled U.S. Uh, construction plans. But bad public relations, high maintenance and repair costs, and fear of consequences also play a large part. Um, just a few facts that I, that I dug up here. Worldwide, there are 439 nuclear reactors in 31 countries. Um, and most of those are generating electricity. There's a few of them that are not. There are 68 under construction worldwide, so 68 new plants are being built right now, and 28 of those are in the People's Republic of China alone. And um, we don't have to worry about those, um, though, with China's history of forthrightness, oversight, and stringent environmental safeguards, not to mention an almost corruption-free political environment. <laughs> and uh, of course, I'm being sarcastic. That's my "Are you freaking kidding me?" moment for the for the night. So, 28 new plants in China. Um, the U.S. has 100 commercial reactors at 65 different plants. All of these began construction by 1974, 
And after Three Mile Island's partial core meltdown in 1979, all future projects were canceled. Um, so in 2012, the Nuclear, Nuclear Regulatory Commission approved the construction of four new reactors at existing plants, which are underway and, um, in the U.S. right now. So I didn't, I didn't know that either, that uh, there are four reactors being built right now at existing U.S. plants, um, one of which is, uh, so then there's a fifth one, in 1988, the Watts Bar nuclear facility in Tennessee, um, the TVA had mothballed a, a reactor in process in 1988, and that they uh, began or, uh, building on that again, I think, you know, a couple years ago, and that Unit 3 is almost completed. So there's five new nuclear reactors coming online. Uh, but in an unprecedented uh, development in 2013, four aging reactors were permanently closed in the United States. Um, two of those are in California at San Onofre. Uh, one of them's in Florida at the Crystal River plant, and one of them is in Wisconsin at the Kiwani plant. And then, of course, as we know in Vermont, um, Entergy has announced the closure <clears throat> of Vermont Yankee, which is a uh, scheduled for decommissioning soon once they start, you know, ironing out the details about how they're going to even go about doing that. Um, that is the same design plant, um, General Electric plant, as, as the ones at Fukushima. Well, that's another, you know, little known fact or, uh, you know, a, a fact that they try not to get, in, get into the public, that it's the, yeah, it's the same design. And, you know, we fought quite a battle in, uh, here in Vermont to get uh, Vermont Yankee closed. And, you know, they sued the state and they did everything they could to keep it open. And then finally, you know, they say for economic reasons, they're, they're going to decommission it. They you know, I, li I like that. to I like to think I that the uh, you know the opposition had something you know yeah. played a part in that. Uh, yeah, I, I I bet you it did. I know natural gas um, and the the falling prices of natural gas because of you know fracking operations. I I know because a natural gas generating plant, a thermal plant, is is so much cheaper and less expensive to build and to operate than a nuclear plant. Um, that's part of it. But remember. There was a lot of leaks being discovered, um, tritium-contaminated water, remember, on, this, on site there? Absolutely. And I'm sure liability had something to do with that, too. They're, they're probably trying to yank up stakes and run before, you know, potentially that state regulators or federal people could actually ascertain how much leaking has gone on there and how much damage. Yeah. Because um, leaking radioactive material into the groundwater is never going to be good, no matter, no matter how they spin it. Well, one of the, um, you know, bottom lines of this, this whole thing is that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission uh, is the one do, doing the oversight, and they, of course, they have, you know, they're completely uh, one and the same as the nuclear industry. Right, it's basically and a pro, a pro-nuclear industry uh, cheerleader. Yeah, exactly. Kind of a front group, yeah. And so they're, you know, they are out to make money for the nuclear industry. And, you know, in this case, Fukushima, you know, you just have this incredible disaster that's already a disaster, you know, within Japan and within the Pacific Ocean. Yeah. Talking about polluting the entire Pacific Ocean. And, you know, they're trying to sweep it under the rug and say everything's fine and plants are safe and, uh, it's you funny know, there's, how just, you can, there's no real oversight, you know. Yeah, and you can dance around the fact or, or not even report it and, and take yourself seriously when, remember, we were talking about the, the total core meltdowns and now they've actually, TEPCO has actually admitted that they're, they are full meltdowns. Um, it's called a, a Corian lava once you get a molten mass of the uranium fuel rods and the zirconium that contained it, and they're loose beneath those plants and they have no idea where they are. And um, I, I just, I can't imagine that not even making the news, not, not one day and, and, not even, and certainly not sustaining that, you know. There's like steam eruptions occasionally coming up from the site 
um, where so they know that at least one of them is still incredibly hot and hitting the aquifer. So they've burned through the steel containment, they've melted through the concrete at the bottom of the facility, and they're now in the earth and, and loose. This is a total meltdown that you know has been the the worst you know fear of the uh, nuclear industry aside from nuclear power aside from you know total explosion above ground yeah and it's not even in the news you know no i mean that's that is media control beyond beyond belief i mean i'm with this show i'm trying to sh to illustrate that and prove that point that that um you you actually have to be skeptical to say the least of almost every story that you get from commercial media because you know there's almost always a, a, an agenda behind the scenes which is some industry somewhere you know trying to control what's let out or control what you think by what information is dribbled out and um, I know New York State is also seeking to close the Indian Point plant in uh, Buchanan New York, which is less than 30 miles from downtown Manhattan. So uh, can you imagine trying to evacuate Manhattan after a, after a nuclear accident? So, um, so back to Fukushima a little bit. Um, thanks to Dennis Trainer Jr. and his brilliant acronym TV for, for uh, helping me put together five reasons why you should care about Fukushima. So number one, like we said, is there's three entire core meltdowns that are unaccounted for. They've probably escaped their containment and are either in or near the groundwater. Um, the, this intense contamination of the aquifer could lead to huge problems for the 15 million people of Tokyo and the surrounding area, uh, including a, an evacuation or at the very least contamination of their drinking water sources, or even what's called a hydrovolcanic explosion if one of these um, Corian lavas penetrates through a layer of bedrock and gets trapped beneath it with, with water available, um, the buildup of pressure can actually cause, theoretically cause, a very large explosion. And that would come from directly beneath the site where all the tanks are stored, the water tanks and, and the fragile buildings and the, you know, it's, it's just, it's mind boggling. So, and the radioactive water that's pouring into the Pacific and piling up in, in the steel tanks with no end in sight, um, which has been going on for two and a half years. Um, the 1,500 spent fuel rods that are four floors above reactor four in a building destroyed by hydrogen air explosions that we all saw early in the disaster. Remember the coverage of those? I'll never forget sitting there and watching those massive explosions right in the containment buildings. and. And the commentators and the experts are like, oh, that's all right, it happens. You know, I mean, they, they blow up every now and again. <laughs> Shit happens. Yeah, huh? I just, I couldn't believe how somebody could just like poo-poo that off. But most importantly is the media blackout. I mean, have you heard about the removal of damaged fuel assemblies by workers with cranes? Um, they've never been removed without computer control before because if even two touch, you can cause what's called a monumental chain reaction that, um, with consequences that are just unimaginable. So there are 80 damaged fuel assemblies leaking radiation in storage pools presently. Um, so our government, this is the fifth point, your, our government has kindly offered to help Japan with decommissioning the reactors and with the ongoing leakages of water and whatnot. And is this a move by a good Samaritan? Maybe not. As a condition of assistance, the US has demanded that Japan sign the Convention on Supplementary Compensation for Nuclear Damage, a typical tongue twister acronym, but it's called the CSC. So while insisting that the CSC simply defines liability or answers the who should pay um, issue, the real aim is to protect the nuclear industry. It caps the total compensation available after accidents to levels much lower than actual costs. The companies that supply nuclear reactors and the materials, um, in this case General Electric, are completely exempt. They don't have to pay anything if there's an accident. Well, there, there you have it right there. So who pays, you know, people pay with their lives and, and the public pays for the for the cleanup. 
Right, I know. It's, um, and they just leave a nuclear mess and move on. They, so long. Yeah, it's a, definitely an industry protection move. So we are almost done here. Um, I just want to read this one statement. The impacts of Fukushima could affect almost everyone on the planet. So we all have a stake in the outcome. If the worldwide public is informed about the problem, the political will to solve it will develop rapidly. This last statement comes from a recent article by Kevin Zeese and Margaret Flowers called Everything You Need to Know About the Fukushima Crisis. They point out also that in an open letter to the UN, 16 top nuclear experts urged the government of Japan to transfer responsibility for the Fukushima site to a worldwide engineering group overseen by a civil society panel and an international group of nuclear experts independent from the Tokyo Electric Power Company and the IAEA, which is another uh, nuclear industry um, cheerleader that happens to be international. They urge that the stabilization, cleanup, and decommissioning be well-funded, and the request is made with urgency because the situation is progressively deteriorating, not stabilizing. So as a final thought, plants near Los Angeles, New York City, and DC also sit near earthquake faults. If you live near one of these cities, have you ever noticed the lack of evacuation plans? There aren't any. any um, there just aren't any plans because evacuation of New York City or Los Angeles is just practically impossible. So all the plants in less populated areas do have evacuation plans, um, even though there's no practice or drills. Hmm. Okay, so there's a ton more to go over, and I guess we will uh, pick up this issue in another edition of Critical Mass TV. So thank you very much, Arthur, for joining me. You're welcome. And uh, we are now going to move along with Kathy and Art Break. So we'll see you next time. Email me at criticalmassbrad at gmail.com. Thank you very much. Welcome to Art Break. This is a segment where I focus on art, people who create art, um, creative people, people who appreciate art. And um, today my guest is Tom Creswell. He has been to France, um, and I want to talk a little bit about, um, everybody knows that France is rich in the arts. Uh, people associate France with Impressionist painters, uh, Monet, Cezanne, Manet, Renoir. Um, that was all like 200 years ago. 
Um, and then there was dance and ballet. The first ballet ever was performed in France in 1518. And there's architecture and church and monuments. Um, Notre Dame was completed in 1345, um, over 650 years ago. There are museums, and that all seems like a long time ago. But um, we're going to go back 30,000 years ago and, and longer. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to go back a long time. Um, the earliest art that I guess we even know of is um, the Paleolithic cave paintings. There's some in France, um, there's been some discovered in um, Spain, Germany, possibly Germany. Mm -hmm. And um, so, Tom, you have been to some of these caves. Yes. And um, they must be just incredible. You've been in, in the caves and seen some of these pale. We have seen the actual, actual paintings uh, that were made thousands of years ago. Yep. Yes. Um, we have lots of images to show you. So um, I guess let's start first of all with um, um, one of these images that shows uh, the map of, of France. And this is going to help you help our viewers sort of get an idea of we're going to see France and then we're going to zoom into the rivers and the regions of most of these caves. Okay, so tell us a little bit about um, maybe are we looking north, south, east, west? We're looking in the, in the south central part of, uh, of France where it says Mass, Massif Central. Okay. Uh, right in that area. Um, there are, there's actually three rivers that run from this, the center of France towards the, uh, uh, towards the, the Atlantic Ocean. Okay, show and me. The, and the, the, yeah, show the rivers. Let's go to the next image with the rivers. Okay, okay the Dordogne River is, uh, is the most, the northernmost of those three rivers. And that's the area where uh, we, we went to and where most of, uh, where the, the artwork is, is uh, really um, concentrated. Uh, there's a, a river, a tributary of the Dordogne, which is the Vezier River. Uh, it doesn't show on this map, but it comes into the Dordogne from the north. Mm -hmm. And in that area, uh, there, there are just, there's cave art and there's Neanderthal caves. Um, there, are, there are hundreds of sites Okay. In that area. All right. So let's go on. Let's go on to the next. <coughs> this is Dord Dordogne. This is a, a typical uh, village, uh, say a, mid a medieval uh, village in uh, in the Dordogne uh, River Valley. Mm -hmm. okay. <coughs> we can go on. So the next image. Mm okay. Uh, this is the Dordogne River. Uh, we were on a boat trip on on the river. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yes, there's lots of cliffs uh, uh, are, are they, on the river banks. Are these limestone cliffs, or uh, they, I don't know if this this okay. is probably limestone. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, neat, neat that they build right on the river on, down from that cliff. That's beautiful. Um, hang on one second. I think I have to unmute myself here. Okay. I was muted. Now I'm unmuted. Okay, so then this is the next image. This is oh, this is uh, a town called uh, Roque Amador. Um, it, I think we skipped one. Uh, the river town and then Roque Amador. The Roque Amador. Yeah, there should be okay. two of Roque Amador. Okay, well, I think we might be on this Let's one. Let's go here. to the next one. Okay. Okay. There's uh, the town of Roque Amador, which is built right into a wow. cliff. Look at that. It is just a fantastic uh, a town. Uh, we stayed there for, I think, six days. And uh, mm. it's pretty amazing. Uh, the, the lowest level is where people live. And then the middle level, uh, there were, I, think, I believe, three churches were built there. And then at the very top, there's a, uh, a fortress which defended the town. Uh, so when you stay there, is there an inn? There's an, there's an inn there, yes. Hmm. And, uh, we stayed at the inn. That's uh, great. Look, and they're building building right into the rocks. They built they built right in, uh, right into the cliffside. 
Um, so now if we could go to the, okay. the previous one, the, the, the landscape one. The one before one. that, yeah. This is taken from uh, at, at, I guess, the mid-level looking down. Right, looking down at the and, river. And looking out around the, around the, uh, the valley. Mm -hmm. okay. Wow, that's really, really neat. That's so now beautiful. let's go to... Let's uh, go to the... Uh, the Lasco. Oh, okay. Here we go. So this is the Lasco. This is Lasco, Lasco which cave. is probably the most famous of uh, of uh, oh. the uh, cave art that, that we know of. Most most. Uh, right. How far into the cave do you think these this image is? I mean, is it hundreds of feet before you get to some of these images? Or that's a good question because we couldn't go into the actual cave. Okay. Here. This okay. was uh, this was this cave is not no longer open to the public because uh, the the uh, paintings were being damaged by right. uh, by all the humidity and, and uh, too many people in the, in the oxygen cave. Oxygen. Yeah, I think it's mostly mm -hmm. uh, too much humidity mm -hmm. in, in the in the inside the cave. Hmm. So they built a replica cave. Oh, I see. And and. Uh, now this image may be the actual image, right? Um, but the cave that we went into was the replica, and it's not nearly as 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 big as the actual cave. And so this is these are these are bulls, bulls, right? Yeah. And, and um, um, is there any? And there are actually some uh, in the center. You can see some uh, some reindeer. Oh yes. So these paintings were probably done at different times. Ooh, over... and of course, at the at the top of the of the, uh, the oh, there's a horse. It's a horse. Oh yeah. yeah. So maybe they probably don't, like thousands of years later, they might have decided to do another painting <laughs> on top. Of, right. Who knows? I think uh, um, there were multiple artists in these. In yeah. These, uh, in All right. Caves. Let's go to the next image. The uh, the horse. Ooh, look at that. Okay, I think that's a pretty famous image of a horse, and it's pretty stylized. It is. Look at that. Yeah, yeah. it's better, it's kind of, sometimes better than some of the stuff I've seen today. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's go to the next one. Um, how do you how do you pronounce Peshmeral. that? Peshmeral. Peshmeral, spotted horse. This is a spotted horse, um, and they've actually. Um, there's been a, a lot of doubt through the years, I guess, about whether uh, what the spots mean on mm -hmm. a horse. Yeah, but what it could they mean? Turns out that they've done some DNA, DNA testing and DNA studies, and they've determined that there were horses back in those days that were spotted. Ah, okay. And so this is pretty realistic. Mm -hmm. uh, and we and we see a hand above it, and we'll there probably are, talk about that a little bit. I can see two hand two hands in this yeah. one. There's uh, yeah. one behind the horse and one above it. Ah, yes, um, yes, and behind it. Yeah, yeah. look at that. And uh, this is something that that shows up in caves, uh, all over these caves. Uh, that there are uh, lots of handprints. Right. And there are handprints of uh, really small ones that, that are probably children. Right. Um, huh. Handprints of, of women. There is one, in fact, there's one cave where there's a handprint. Uh, they can tell that the same artist um, went through the had, whole went cave. through the whole cave and, and did his handprint over and over again because he had a crooked finger. Hmm. And, uh, and Interesting. kept seeing the crooked finger handprint. Following him through again. the cave. Yeah. How did they make the colors? This is very colorful. Um, well, they used minerals mm -hmm. for their colors, and mm -hmm. these and these obviously these colors have held up quite well over uh, yeah. thousands of years. Right, uh, like iron oxide for. Okay, uh, the red, red is a is one of their most common colors, right. and that's an that's an iron oxide. Mm -hmm. it's, Mm -hmm. And black is black. the is the other color that they use mostly, and they either use the uh, manganese, mm -hmm. and apparently sometimes they use charcoal for black. Huh? For Can black. we go to the next image? And um, oh, look at that! Yeah, there's there's the manganese and okay, charcoal this, possibly. This was taken off the internet, mm -hmm. and, and the uh, the actual rock. Uh, the, this this actual uh, painting has a lot more going on, but but they just focused on the four horse heads. Right. Um, 
And beautiful. I think the thinking is here that the, the artist in this case was, was trying to, uh, to show motion. Uh, depict motion by, yeah. right. It's almost and, like animation. Yeah. It's, yeah. Like the little flip charts. <laughs> you know, those little flip books. Some uh, oh. Paleolithic flip charts. Flip charts, right. <laughs> Aren't they clever? Um, the next image is lions. Ooh. Lions. Ooh, look at that. Um, oh, that looks like motion, too. Well, it could. Or, yeah. or maybe just yeah, a herd. Sure. Or, yeah. 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 And I included this one to show that uh, the climate over, over uh thousands of years changed okay. uh, as the, uh, this was actually during the Ice Age, but the, uh, the glaciers would recede and then they would come back right. uh, and recede again. And at this time, um, this part of France had lions and it was uh -huh. a fairly warm climate. Right. That is the um, upper Paleolithic um, period is right at the end of the ice age. So the ice would be receding and coming back and receding and coming back yeah. and warming and cooling during that whole era. Huh. Well, we also have a video of um, the Chauvet. Chauvet Cave. Um, maybe Jim can put that video up for us. Um, basically, it shows several different images in that cave. And um, we can just talk about some of this. Um, no one is allowed in this cave. Here's a better image of the ho four horse heads. And look at the, oh, there there's the, that, that's um, the same image, yeah. right. This is, uh, look at that. This is another part. This is all, all the Chauvet Cave. The Chauvet Cave the Chauvet has the cave. oldest, uh, I think the oldest cave paintings that have been discovered. Right. Um, and that cave was only discovered in 1998. 1998. Yeah. And um, it was perfectly preserved because rocks and formations had crashed down and covered the entrance. And so there was no entrance anymore. And um, I don't know how they actually discovered how to get in there. It was like you had to crawl in on your stomach to get through there, I think. Yeah. And There's an excellent movie uh, yes. done by uh, Werner Herzog. The, uh, do you have that right there? Yeah, and it's called The Cave of Forgotten Dreams. Definitely worth seeing. It's just incredible, and they take you through the whole cave, how it was discovered, um, how they were only able to be in there a couple hours to document a lot of these image, images. But it's beautifully, beautifully written documentary, and it's just really pretty much unbelievable. Yeah. And there's more spots. I think you can see in, in, in a lot of these images how uh, the uh, the these people were real artists. They were. They were not. Uh, they were not just scratching on the walls. Yeah. Um, and the this particular cave, I know that the, the the images are way way deep, far into the cave. You you walk quite a ways, and it just looks like a your typical limestone cave with your stalactites and stalagmites, and then you go deep, and all of a sudden these images start appearing on the walls. That looks that's like a, a hyena. hyena. Yeah, yes. that's great. So they did a lot of, they just did paintings of animals, there's not a, There's people. a rhino there. They didn't do people or landscapes. No, they did uh, mostly animals. Right. Uh, very few people. Right. Um, and and no, they, never, they never painted a tree. Huh, isn't that incredible? Who knows, who knows and why. And this almost looks like motion also, with different yeah. legs. Yeah, it looks like, uh, it shows, does look like motion. Shows them running. Another way they they would depict motion, or they could depict motion, was in the um, the flickering light from their oil lamps. Really, would sometimes show make animals come to life. That's interesting, isn't it? And then, um, what about like didn't they use like the contours of the caves and to 
show different ways of the animals coming in and out of, of the cave. Yeah. And using the yeah. cracks and contours of... But they would use the... Uh, uh, they would use the, the, the rock itself as uh, to, to, to emphasize parts right. of the animals. And right, that is, that is very creative. Um, yeah. So there's an, let's go to the next image. Um, um, Rufinyak? Rufinyak? Is that the... Um, let's see if we can get that image up here. And... Um, there's a woolly mammoth from Rufinyak. There it is. Um, Rufinac is, is has uh, something like a hundred woolly mammoths. Look uh, at that! That is uh, so perfect. Yeah, it's beautiful. Is that it, it has it? how many images? Of? Oh, just just lots and lots of uh, mammoths in in uh, in Rufinac. Right. That was the cave that that we went into. You actually got to go in there. Yeah, we got to see these images. Yes. Wow. That must be just. It must just. Take you back in time. I mean, is it hard <laughs> it to even believe does. you're seeing these? I yeah. mean, wow. Okay, so let's go to the next. Um, the rhino. <gasps> Look at that. I love that. You can't mistake it. No. And they did this all with candlelight and torches, right? Yeah. You know. Huh. Amazing. And you get to see that one in. Rufinac is quite a long cave, and uh, we actually. To, to get to the site where the where the uh, the paintings are, uh, there is a train oh. that goes uh, underground through the through the uh, through a cave passage really? for maybe half a mile. Really? Yeah. Must and, be a and, small train. Oh yeah, it's a real <laughs> real tiny little train. A little you, track. Get to, you get to sit in uh, in an open car and huh. and travel through until wow. you come to the. Uh, uh, where there are some paintings, and mm -hmm. you can then, and then get out. And then does the train have to back out again? I think it goes. It just goes backwards. Yeah, yep. it just goes the other direction, and takes you back out. Wow! Yeah. It's, so you can so that you get to see this incredible ancient yeah. art. Um, the next image is um, in this is, Spain. This is from Altamira, the, a cave in Spain. Um, wow, and I included that. this because it's such spectacular uh, coloring yeah. on this one. Yeah, that took some uh, time. This this is a bison. Mm -hmm. And uh, look at the fur on the back and on the hump. And I don't know how closely related they are to the American bison, right. but uh, but they're they're pretty similar. Yeah, it uh, you know um, I think some of these historians are, are studying what these animals look like back then and yeah. the, the different species and some of them that they painted on these caves are now extinct. Um, that's really really cool. Um, so the next one is of handprints. Look yeah, handprints that. are. Uh, are, are, are kind of ubiquitous. They're all over uh, in these caves. And Why the way they did these was the artist would put his hand on the rock and then he would either blow through, blow paint through a, through a tube, a reed or, or, a, or a hollow bone or something, or he would actually just uh, put the paint in his mouth and, and spit it onto the rock. And then, after, when he removed his hand, um, that's what that's was, what they got. Yeah, it was a stencil. It was a stencil. Yeah. The earliest stencils. Wow. And now, why do you suppose they did their hands? Good question. Was it a signature, or mm -hmm. was it some sort of religious uh, mm -hmm. thing? We we really don't know. Interesting. And then you can see maybe the different ages of the people that did that. Were they like children's hands? Well, there are some. There are a few small hands, yeah. uh, which huh. indicates that that children were, were doing this in the case. Yeah, too. maybe it was a signature of of I was here. I did this painting. Yeah. Huh. Sure. Um, the next one is of a carving of horses in okay. relief. Oh. So this. This was in the museum in the town of uh, Les Aizy, which is really in the center of all this. Okay. Um, and this was a, uh, a frieze mm -hmm. of uh, horses. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and they had so take, taken it out of a 
cave or is just yeah this was removed from the cave I'm not really sure what the circumstances were there but it was in it was being displayed in the, in the museum and it was uh, well you can see that it wasn't just painting there was uh, they did a lot of uh, uh, sculpting right as well I wonder how old this is do you have any idea? I don't No. I don't know this one no it's a whole different kind of art it's the it's a sculpture instead yeah, yeah. Um, the next image is uh, Itzeritz oh. so we did go and, and visit some limestone caves also with uh, that are that are just limestone formations with uh, cool. stalagmites yeah. and, uh, yeah, they're they're pretty spectacular. It was the first time I'd ever been in caves like that. The and, dripping uh, of the limestone yeah. sinks and the cool. They make all kinds of crazy formations, ribbony looking things. And yeah. They they yeah they look like humans and crazy <laughs> stuff. They just form their own neat stuff over millions of years. It's just so cool. Um, the next image is similar. Yep. And this one has a little staircase built into the limestone. It, it was, oh, I, I don't know how that formation came to be like that, but. Uh, or who did it or when they uh, did it? We walked right up through there yeah. into, uh, yeah. into the little room at the top there. Yeah. Yeah. Other so. people wanted to see everything too. Yeah. Okay, well, that is, um, that's it for those. Uh, cave cave art images, and um, we just have a couple minutes left. Um, I know that the um, the early um, Paleolithic period um, went from seven hundred and fifty thousand years ago to roughly fifteen thousand years ago, and so these cave paintings were roughly anywhere from like 20 to 35 or 40,000 years ago, right at the end of the Paleolithic period. And um, the Paleolithic period went from like stone and bone tools all the way to, um, they learned how to, they did flaking and hand axes and spears and they made harpoons and then they built rafts and then they were able to travel. Um, fire and food, you know, cooking over fire were in that era, and bow and arrow. And um, it's just a fascinating, fascinating period. And unfortunately, we just don't have a whole lot of time left. We, we could have seen so much more of, about, about France. We could have seen food, um, because we all know that there's like crepes and baguettes, and wine, and Yes, so, we love the food. Yeah, the food is, is an art in itself, and so we'll have to have you back another time. Oh, I'd love to. And um, talk about the, the art of, of the food of France, and we can maybe talk about the caves a little bit more, the churches, the buildings, the architecture. There's so much in this world that is creative and artistic. And um, if you ever want to be on my show, um, I would love to um, promote your, your artwork, your creative spirit, and um, you can contact me at artbreakvermont at gmail.com, and I would um, just love to have you on the show. This is a really fun thing to do, and um, thank you very, oh, well, you know what? Let's look at these, oh. let's look at these two books really quick here. These are two books that you probably should read. Uh, one of them is The Cave Paintings, and this one here is Stepping Stones by Christine oh, Desmanez Hugon. <laughs> this one is good. The Cave Painters by Gregory Curtis, um, highly yes. recommended by Tom yes. and his wife. Yes. And um, thank you all very much, and we'll see you next time on Art Break. Bye. <laughs>